I'd like to begin this section on the British invasion by mentioning that the textbook has very fine narratives on the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, and such. So I will be just presenting some uh, different perspectives on each of these artists. During the Beatles' career, there were actually six individuals who contributed on a regular basis to the music of the Beatles. John, Paul, George, and Ringo were the four Beatles that we ultimately came to know. But there were two other individuals, Pete Best, their original drummer, and Stuart Sutcliffe, a friend of John Lennon's, who was ostensibly a guitar player. Stuart Sutcliffe had no real musical impact upon the music of the Beatles and quit the group fairly early on in their career. Pete Best was initially quite a uh, significant member of the Beatles. He was the best looking of the bunch and attracted the uh, attention of the women in the crowd probably more than the other Beatles. Ultimately, it was when the Beatles attempted to do their first recordings with George Martin that he insisted on using a session, a session drummer for the recordings and uh, the group, in this case agreeing with George Martin, ejected Pete Best from the group and substituted on a regular basis Ringo Starr. It should be understood that the Beatles have never been considered significant instrumentalists in their own right. Paul certainly wasn't one of the best bass players in rock and roll. George, while he did contribute quite a lot of meaningful melodic improvisations and solos, certainly hasn't been included in the top 100 players of uh, guitar players of rock and roll either. The only member of the group that might be considered of uh, a status to be a model for rock and roll drummers was Ringo Starr. The most significant event of the Beatles' career, and perhaps in all rock and roll, is the release in 1967 of the Sgt. Pepper's album. Not only did this particular piece of music signal a change in direction for the Beatles' career, but also for the entire culture of rock and roll. This music had been previously looked at as a utilitarian music, dance music, music for fun. But this album changed rock and roll into an art that had to be listened to intellectually. It should be understood that the most important element of music to Beatles music, and the one that characterizes it the best, is melody. The Beatles, right from the beginning of their career right up until the end, were considered great melodists, in particular Lennon and McCartney. Their melodies were always very tuneful, and they were very prolific at producing those melodies. They produced a lot of them. The Beatles had 29 number one hits in the British Isles and had about 15 in the United States. Their tunes continue to be covered by many rock and roll artists today and they're used in many television commercials, movies, and other media. I would venture to say that 200 years from today when the Beatles or rock and roll aren't even a dim memory in most people's minds, that it is this group that will be used to represent this entire 55-year history of rock and roll. The Beatles cannot be looked at as a one-hit wonder, or even a group whose consistency of style makes their music sound the same, whether it's the beginning of their career or the very end. The Beatles would be very influenced by music from outside of rock and roll, as well as many other groups in rock and roll. They would become models, models for those other groups as well as those groups started to evolve their own music throughout the 60s. The Beatles, like Elvis Presley, can be looked at as having about three developmental eras. The first era was that era prior to 1964 when their music had very simple lyrics, background accompaniment, drum beats, and rhythm, rhythm patterns. They also had very simple bass lines. The rock sound that they used during this period was primarily the rock sound of the 1950s, and it was dominated primarily by a lead singer or unison singing. There was a middle Beatles period that started in around 1964 up until about the time of Sgt. Pepper's, when they used much more poetically complex lyrics, they were much more symbolic with a universalist point of view, sometimes even critical words in some of their songs. It was very much more creative music than we'd heard previously, more guitar-oriented, less percussive. Sometimes a folk-like quality worked itself in. And they used much more complicated guitar sounds and electronics as well as acoustic music scoring. There were more subjects in the musical lyrics during this period, and there was much better background accompaniment. During the middle period and into the late Beatles period, 
there was much more growing dissension between the members of the group. Uh, but during the late period, we also have more use of electronic music. It, it was basically studio music that could not be reproduced on stage, even if they had been performing live. The music was much more technically precise than it had been during earlier eras, although they seemed to go back to more of a rock and roll basis. There were many more mystical allusions and more total communication from the lyrics during this period. Going back to the characteristic of the Beatles themselves, let's mention that quite often there is a term used that is called the fifth Beatle. This term traditionally has been used to represent a, uh, an organ player, black organ player from the United States by the name of Billy Preston, who was the only feature artist ever to record on any of the Beatles albums along with the members of the group. This was on the Let It Be album, and only for just a couple weeks did he uh, put his input into this album. However, for our purposes, I would uh, point out that it is probably George Martin, their producer, father image, tutor, uh, composer, arranger, uh, who is probably the one that needs to be considered the fifth Beatle. The Beatles were very much a group of the 60s. They represented this era, and they broke at just the right time for a group like this to become the most popular pop group in the world. But indeed, their influence echoes right up until the present. While the Beatles' history essentially starts in the year 1956 when Lennon and McCartney first come together in, in Lennon's group called the Quarrymen, the Rolling Stones' history essentially starts in around 1960, about four years later, when two of the original members, Keith Richard and Mick Jagger, first come together in a group called the Blues Boys or Blues Incorporated which was filled with a lot of juvenile delinquents and musicians who would hang around a nightclub in London called the Erling or Ealing Club. By 1963, Charlie Watt, the drummer, and Bill Wyman, the bass player, had fallen into place with this group. And in 1963, when they signed their first recording contract, it was a uh, guitar player by, and keyboard player by the name of Brian Jones who became the nominal leader of the group because he happened to be the only guy who so showed up for the signing session. As we move through the 60s with the Rolling Stones, Brian Jones began causing all sorts of problems for the group. He had a, a drug problem which uh, began to magnify and by 1967 was ejected from the group, dying a couple of years later of a drug overdose. It was at this time that Mick Jagger took over not only the onstage but the offstage leadership of the Rolling Stones. The Rolling Stones first recorded in 1963, but it wasn't until 1965 that they did their first original song, Satisfaction. The mid to late 60s were a period where the Rolling Stones spent their time primarily in competition with the Beatles, although they were of very different energies. Even as the Rolling Stones are launching their first tour of the United States late in 1964, the Beatles are already of worldwide significance. And again, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones did admire each other significantly. The Rolling Stones, unlike the Beatles, were influenced over and over by rhythm and blues from the United States. That became their primary model for their music. Throughout the 1960s, they recorded tunes that had originally been recorded by rhythm and blues artists in the United States, like Chuck Berry, and also Beatles songs. In 1967, the Rolling Stones put out a singular album called At Their Satanic Majesty's Request, became some of the most uh, successful mystical rock of the late 1960s, although the album itself was not a commercial success. During the late 60s, the Rolling Stones started having legal problems, primarily with possession of drugs, and started using this as a publicity tact, a strategy for building their image as the bad boys of rock and roll, probably to contrast them with the mop tops, the Beatles. Like the Beatles, the Rolling Stones had a very close group relationship, hanging together not only off stage but doing a show that very much would convince you that they were all part of the same act. The Stones can be said to have uh, four de developmental periods. The first period, uh, where they started recording in 1963 up through 1965, 
Much of their music was very skiffle and riff-oriented, with rhythm and blues tunes being the tunes that they covered. They're bad, they had a very bad recording quality, working for relatively small recording companies, with very simple beat, guitar, bass patterns, very loud vocals with the lead singer dominant, very short songs, and very sexual lyrics. Their second period, which was basically the last part of the 1960s, they used much more electronics and special effects, basically an influence from the uh, Beatles. Uh, the guitar solos became more important during this period. The music itself was much more original and very much more sex sexual and mystical. There was a uh, stronger beat to the music, and of course the use of drugs dominated the last part of this uh, decade. Their third period, from around 1971 to 1980, uh, had much more technically clear recordings, more complicated guitar and electronic sounds. The studio recordings started sounding different from the live performances. They were much more diversified, although they still used a rhythm and blues model. It was during this period that they created a strategy for all major artists since then of uh, basically touring much less and only touring with the release of their albums, which they released only on a two to three year basis. Prior to this, most groups had been re recorded and toured virtually all of the time. Their fourth period from 1981 basically up to the present was much more commercial. They started using some funk oriented rhythmic styles. There was a much bigger variety of instruments, much denser sound to the recordings with more complicated use of guitar and percussion. And there was also more use of instrumental solos. The Who was a group that was formed in around 1963-1964, originally made up of members Roger Daltrey on vocals, Pete Townsend, guitarist, and John Entwistle, the bass player. They were later joined by drummer Keith Moon, who again died in 1978 and was replaced by Kenny Jones of Faces at that time. The original concept of The Who, at least during the 1960s, was to be a mod band. This was a concept that was quite different from most of the other bands in London at the time. Uh, prior to 1965, there was the rocker movement, which basically had uh, the audience dressed up in leather jackets, uh, very mean looks on their faces. They s smoked cigarettes. They rode Harley-Davidson-type -David motorcycles, and they emulated the American rebel without a cause lifestyle. This rocker movement basically represented youth from the lower socioeconomic classes of Britain. But there was another movement that started in around 1964, basically with kids from the higher socioeconomic classes, and this was the mod movement. These kids had their own bands. They dressed in mod clothing, a little more psychedelic toward the end of the 1960s. They uh, took acid. They uh, rode motor scooters and they dressed in the highest fashions of the time. The Who's group relationship was very much different from the Rolling Stones or the Beatles. They did not have a close group relationship either on stage or after the gig was over. On stage, it was if four guys were doing four totally different shows. This was emblematic of the music of Mod, which was very chaotic, uh, almost uh, perfect, purposely ridiculous or absurd. The mod movement as a cultural movement can be pointed to as the precursor, perhaps, of the punk movement during the 1970s. The members of The Who didn't seem to like each other either. They offstage, they did not spend any time with one another, and there was an ongoing feud between Daltrey and Townsend during their career. In 1969-1970, The Who uh, basically took a break from their normal uh, mod music, and they did a couple of albums that became classic albums, at least in the rock opera movement. The first was Tommy in 1969, and then another one in 1970 called Quadrophenia. Later, when we talk about art rock, we will explain some of the characteristics of rock operas that associate themselves with art rock. Elton John is the last artist that we mentioned in the uh, British Invasion as we chronologically follow about a 16-year uh, progression. Uh, Elton John got his start in around 1969 when he met with his lyricist, Bernie Taupin, for the first time. Uh, 
Uh, uh, They started putting out albums almost immediately. The first album wasn't all that successful, but almost every other album between 1970 and 1975 was extremely successful, at least in Britain, and Elton John became an international superstar. Elton John had a very bland childhood. He was only a piano player during his youth years when he was playing with groups such as Bluesyology. It was only in 1969 that he discovered his singing voice and started to sing as well as play the piano. There are several reasons for us to talk about the talent of Elton John. First of all, he's a very proficient piano player, and because of his his instrumental expertise, he also wrote incredibly compelling melodies. His singing style is very strong and sensitive. He emoted expressive qualities through his singing. And, of course, the songwriting team of John and Taupin was very long-lasting. Although it started to decay at the end of the 1970s, it did come back together in the early 2000s. But he also understood the importance of theatrical performance and always played his parts to the hilt, dressing in very flamboyant costumes. He created more of the idea of image in rock and roll during the 1970s. 